pump. Lights, turning on the water, uh, getting the sewage operating, so that the people of Baghdad and Iraq in general have an opportunity to reestablish their, their individual lives. And that's very important. Retired Colonel Oliver North has spent time with our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, seeing the war on terror and the rebuilding process up close. Earlier, I asked Colonel North, how well are we rebuilding the, that war-torn country? And that's today's big question. The good news, Judge, is that what's happening is these remarkable young soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines who we've got deployed in that part of the world, we're talking Afghanistan and Iraq particularly, but also the Horn of Africa, is that they are in there and they've built relationships with people who want democracy, who want freedom. And we've given them that hope of liberty that we enjoy in this country. The most telling example of how well we're doing isn't in the negative press from much of the mainstream media. The best exemplar of how this is going is the fact that in Iraq, it was a local Iraqi who went to a U.S. soldier who said, I think I know where Saddam Hussein is hiding. That kind of thing is happening all over the Horn of Africa. It's happening in Afghanistan. And of course, it's happened with vivid, vivid a de demonstration in Iraq. It's good news, and we're just not getting enough of it. So what you're saying is that our soldiers in the streets are actually building relationships with people, and from those relationships come intelligence information of the most profound importance. You know, I, I've been to Afghanistan once for Fox. I've been over to uh, Iraq twice with these youngsters. And, of course, phase one of the war was a, a tough contest. Right. And yet notwithstanding the prognostications of all the experts, except on Fox. All these talking, <laughs> these armchair admirals, these barroom brigadiers, these soundbite special forces. Even one of them now running for president of the United States. Ex Wesley Clark predicted on the 25th of March that it would take 3,000 American casualties and we'd be months before we got to Baghdad. Ten days later, Baghdad's ours. Right. What, what I'm suggesting to you is that the people in those countries Notwithstanding what their governments, you're absolutely right, the governments, the Taliban government, the government of Saddam Hussein, right. never wanted his people to have what we're offering them. And that's a chance for self-governance, democratic aspirations, a free enterprise system, and particularly in Iraq, it's working. Now, you were in Iraq, I think, shortly before Hussein uh, was caught. Yeah, and what, what was the attitude? What was the well, feeling? Did they know what was coming? General Odierno, the commanding general of the 4th Infantry. A nice Division. Italian guy from New Jersey. And a great guy. <laughs> and obviously that shaved head is being replicated. You know, the doctor, the doctor who's right. examining. He, he imitates the general's exactly. haircut. <laughs> and and, and all, of, all of his guys are like that. He said to me, he said, we're going to find Saddam Hussein and we're going to get him. I was skeptical because, quite frankly, we hadn't seen the guy since the first week of the war. Right. And, and this is a guy, Saddam Hussein, I said to the general, you're living in one of his palaces. I've been in three others. The, the places are full of Saddam Hussein's videotapes of himself. He didn't go a week from 1979 onward that he wasn't on television, and he disappeared. Well, now we know why. He's living in a rat hole. The fact is, his guys put together just like good police work. You're familiar right. with that. They, they went and, they, and went back and rechecked and checked again and persisted in interviewing, not interrogating, not threatening. In fact, one of the jokes over there is that you don't have to threaten anybody. All you have to do is say the word Gitmo. They know what Gitmo <laughs> they know means. They know what that means. And they don't want to go to Gitmo. And so they talk and they give a, a lead to somebody else. They follow that lead to another place and eventually tracked him down. Just, it was good police work. I watched 3rd Battalion, 66th Armor up there. No U.S. media had been there since I left them in May. And here's Lieutenant Colonel Larry Jackson and his guys out there with a U.S. Army soldier, a Georgian, not the state, the country, and a local Iraqi national policeman that they had trained. And there's people walking up to him saying, that guy down the street is building IEDs, these wow. improvised explosive devices. They pick him up. That guy fingers two Ba'ath party are, leaders. Are, are, are those kind of fingerings on the streets reliable, or are they motivated by revenge well, no, or political no, grudges? Some of it is political grudges. There's no right. doubt about it. Right. But they kicked, in this case, kicked the door down, caught the two Iraqi Ba'ath party guys, mid-level guys. Right. Here's the arrogance of it. These guys are convinced. I'm talking about the Ba'ath party people. There's probably two to 5,000 of these guys left who have some hope that they're going to get somehow the perks and power and privileges they once had. These Bath Party guys 
are, are saying, because they watch our television, and not, they're not watching Fox, they're watching the Jane Fonda Network. Right. And they're convinced because of the negative coverage, they read our newspapers online, that the United States is going to elect somebody, anybody but Bush, is what one of them said, and that you guys can't take the pain, you'll withdraw, and we'll get Iraq back. When the troops watch and listen to negative coverage, and when they listen to, well, let's be candid, negative speeches, yeah. particularly by former uh, Governor Dean, who, yeah. even after Hussein was caught, blasted the war. Couldn't, couldn't how, just, how do the troops react to that? Just last week, of course, he's, he's talking again about it. Still can't say anything positive about this whole experience. Look, it, there's an effort, and I believe it's a, consider, it's, a, it's a considerable effort on the part of many of the politicians running for political office in this land and by much of our media to separate the commander-in-chief from the troops he leads. Yeah. Well, if you needed any evidence, look at the reception those troops gave the president at Thanksgiving. Look at the kinds of things that they cheer about. And the best indicator of all, the barometer for how troop morale really is, Judge, right. and we've known this since 1777. Washington learned it at Valley Forge. The best barometer of troop morale is the reenlistment rate, and it's off the charts in a positive direction. Oh, that's terrific. How do we measure progress in Iraq? Well, one step at a time, and, and you don't do it by overnight declaring democracy. These people are going to build their own constitution. You know, We took the writings. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm, the, I'm the documentarian for Fox, right? I'm the geezer. Right. I look at... How a we went about geezer. it. But I'm still the geezer. <laughs> I look at how we did it. You know, Madison and Mason take, taking the writings of other Europeans. But we didn't ask the Europeans to write our Constitution for us. Those Virginians sat down and crafted things that fit us and made this democratic ideal what it is when it didn't exist anywhere else on the planet Earth. That same thing is now happening in that part of the world. Here's the Christmas present for everybody in America. Think of this. 1983, Ronald Reagan started the reversal of communism on a little island called Grenada. Right. First time it happened. I remember it well. And since then, there's been a cascade of democracy around the world. It's time for the Middle East to wake up, that that's the, that's the future for them. Can the Iraqi people, because in your experience there, you've dealt with people in the streets as well as with our military, accept the idea of self-governance? Or do you fear, as some journalists do, that they may vote in a regime as tyrannical as the one we just kicked out. Yeah, highly unlikely in Iraq. And, and I say that, and it's highly unlikely you're going to get something like what you've got in Tehran. And here's why. It's a very cosmopolitan, uh, well-educated population, highly urbanized. Much more secularized than Iran. Absolutely. And, I mean, for example, Saddam Hussein did not allow madrasas in his country. For the last 30 years, there were no madrasas in Iraq. Unlike Saudi Arabia or Syria or Egypt or Jordan, and, and, and Tehran, where that kind of thing is routine, where you're teaching young people to hate right. and to kill and to kill themselves. The future of Iraq is giving those youngsters education for petrochemical engineering and physics and chemistry and biology and medicine so that they have something to live for instead of something to die for. Uh, one last question before I uh, let you go. There's been some debate in the past couple of weeks about the size of the military. You're familiar with the Secretary oh, of Defense's yeah. view. Is it big enough? Is look, what we have today big enough? Look, we, we have put a burden on the Guard and Reserve. There's no doubt about that. I think there probably is going to be some restructuring that takes, for example, military police units, which are predominantly in the Guard and Reserve right now, right. and moves a number of those units into the, into the active forces. Does that mean an active force increase? Probably of some small percentage. But as a general matter, I mean, the critics, and they're always looking for something to criticize this. They remember, those same critics are now saying you need to double the size of the armed forces were the same ones who were saying before March 20th, it's going to take you it's months to get to Baghdad. Exactly. And so uh, yeah, I think it's time for everybody to take a deep breath. Here we are. We're at the end of the year. We're celebrating a great holiday. It's time for people to just take a deep breath. Thank God that we've got the Commander-in-Chief we do, the Secretary of Defense, the Joint right. Chiefs, and great military leaders like those that we've seen in Iraq. I see your book. How's War Stories War doing? Stories, it, it, by the way, it's a blockbuster. Good. It's, you know why? Not because it's about me. It's about these soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines who have so well served America. Colonel North, Merry Christmas. And the same to you, Judge. Thank, Thank you. you. Still ahead on the big story.